morning, church. You're welcome again to another Sunday service in Jesus' name. Let's just have a brief word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for another day of the search the scripture. Father, as we want to study your word, come and speak to us yourself, O oh Lord. Just use me as a vessel to bless your people this morning. By the time we all live, we all have a blessing from you. Thank you, Father, because we know you've answered. But in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, it's another time to search the scripture. Because the Bible says, search the scripture for in it you think you have what? Eternal life. That is it. We have eternal life in the scripture. And we're going to search it this morning. And God will bless us in Jesus' name. Yes, who can tell us what we studied last week? Last week, study of the Saturday scripture. Yes, anybody can remember? Yes. Uh, let, me, let me allow Bro Friday. Bro Friday. No, Bro Friday. What did you, what did you study and what was your take home? Uh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What we studied last week is... Is Israel descent on idolatry? Uh, what I learned is that is, the Bible says God is a jealous God, and He has given a commandment that we should not serve or have other God beside Me. So whosoever that goes into idolatry is like a person that spats in the face of God. So as a Christian, we need to serve only the living God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, God is a jealous God. And idolatry doesn't necessarily mean you're making one idol and keeping it aside like all these uh, juju worshippers do. Anything that takes the first place of God in your life is what? It's an idol. It could be your work. It could be your children. It could be money. Anything that replaces the, the place of God in our life is an idol. Thank God. In the message too, God re-emphasized um, that again. Whatever the religion you are from, if you are not born again, you are not following Christ. It might not be anything you have placed aside, but in as much as God is not the supreme, that is an idol. Praise the Lord. May God deliver us from idolatry in Jesus' name. Today we are going to study renewal of the law and offering for the tabernacle. Renewal for the law of the law and offering of the tabernacle. You know, last uh, study, Israel descended. When we say descend, they went down. Now God is trying to bring them up, ascend. By renewing the law again, and then since they want to have a place of worship, and then he now uh, asks them to build a tabernacle. Praise the Lord. Our text is going to be from Exodus chapter 34, 35, and 36. Our memory verse will be from Exodus chapter 35 from verse 1. Can anybody recite it for us? Exodus chapter 35, verse 1. Anybody? Yes. Bro Peter want to recite it for us. Hey, bro Peter want to deliver the brethren today. It has been Sister Caro, Sister Caro now. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words of the commandment from God. Do uh, you should obey them. Exodus 35, verse 1. Praise the Lord. It's right. I, I give you uh, 90%. It's right. At least for you to rescue uh, we, the brothers, uh, I was becoming a sheep. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Bro Clement, I used to rescue us. Uh, it's not there. Praise the Lord. Can somebody read from Exodus chapter 34, from verse 1 to verse 5, and then 35, 1 to 5. A brother, Exodus 34, 1 to 5. 
a sister 35, 1 to 5. Exodus 34, from verse 1 to 5. And the Lord said to Moses, Call two tablets of stone, like the first one, and I will write on these tablets the works that we are on the first tablet which you broke. Two. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. So he caught two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hands the two tablets of stone. Five. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. A sister, chapter 35, verse 1 to 5. And Moses gathered. Exodus 35, and Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord has commanded, that ye, do, that ye sh should do them. Six days shall our work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work during shall be put to death. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is a thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. You can see, after the descent of... Um, the children of Israel into idolatry. God is a merciful God. God is a gracious God. God is a compassionate God. When Moses interceded for the children of Israel, God had mercy. God forgave. God pardoned. That is it. I used to tell people that whoever will go to hell fire, it is not the uh, God is not to be blamed. Why? He has made whatever you, the atrocities you have committed. I've seen people who were chronic criminals who got repented in the prison. They were on the death toll before. They now got clemency. And now they are pastors. And they are on their way to heaven. Why will somebody? Who, whatever your sin, your, no matter the Bible says, if, if it's as dark as scarlet, he will make it white as snow. Whether they will be red like crimson, they shall become white as wool. Why would somebody not want to accept such a thing? And what is it? The devil has blinded their eyes. They will not see the way to salvation. God is so jealous. We know how human beings are. If you have seen a jealous man, I was reading about an incident in Nigeria uh, last week. A man suspected another man to be after his wife. He went, stabbed the man to death. Yes, that is what jealousy can be. So if God, being so jealous, and still had pardon, I still have forgiveness in his heart. Ah, that is a God we need to serve. We see what happened here. In spite of their descent, they went back to idolatry. But God had pardon when they cried. My brethren, my, sisters, uh, my brethren today, whatever your descent, if you come unto God, God will have pardon in Jesus' name. We are going to take the study in three subheadings. One is renewal of the law and promises of victory. Number two is going to be resources for the tabernacle and the appointed workmen. And the third one is fabrication of the temple's material. 
like we were doing it in the introduction, our God can never, never hold his anger forever if you will only come with a penitent heart. He said, whosoever will come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Praise the Lord. Question number one says, what do you learn from the way God forgave the children of Israel? What can you learn from there? The way, in spite of the God, he was so angry. He said he wants to destroy all of them. Both he said, look, don't destroy these people. Instead, destroy me. Still, he forgave. Yes? Bro Friday. Okay, let me, uh, let Bro Christian. Since, uh, let me see your hand if you want to talk, please. Bro Christian. Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, I myself, I learned that God is full of mercy because uh, uh, he, he himself, you know, because of the love he has for us, you know, he will not keep his anger forever. So anybody that call upon him, always forgive the person. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If God can forgive the Israelites of those days, God can forgive anybody if you will repent and come unto him. Praise the Lord. Subtopic number one, renewal of the law and the promise of victory. I want us to learn something here. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 16, do you know, in Exodus chapter 32, verse 16, let us learn something here. He said, and the temples were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graving upon the tables. Let us go to now, Exodus chapter 34, verse 1. Verse 1 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, You did two tablets of stones, like unto the first, and I will write upon these uh, uh, tables the words which were written in the first. If you look at down there, God was telling him that the first one, I wrote it. Now, you were the one that broke the first one. You that stone yourself. Do the writing yourself. What do we learn here? This place is telling us that, yes, the first stone, though made by God himself, he now commanded Moses, do this thing by yourself. That is telling us that God is a God where he is forgive, he's forgiven. He's now putting Moses, now you are a prophet of God. I did this at first. You do it now. What do we see? God is a faithful and a merciful God. God is a gracious God. God is a long-suffering God. God is abundant in goodness. God, once he says the truth, he keeps the truth because he is the truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. God is the truth. Jesus is the truth. Praise the Lord. Not only that, his grace will not leave us when we pray. Our enemy cannot overcome us when we are in the presence of God. Five, God is very long-suffering. God is very sluggish in dispensing anger. Like I told you of that jealous husband. He may be, I had an incident in Kano. There was a lady waiting for her husband. They went for marriage. This lady was waiting for her husband and didn't know that the car she uh, was resting upon belonged to another man that the wife is very jealous. What happened? The lady not asking questions. She said, hey, you are the lady they say has been going after my husband. Stabbed the woman to death. This is a true picture. True story. I know the, do the doctor from Edo State married to an Edo woman. But this woman is from Borono State. Stabbed the woman to death. By the time after, what happened? Why the woman was still struggling? I didn't do this woman anything. Why did you stab me? Why are you resting on my husband's car? I was waiting for my own husband. By the time the husband came, discovered that the husband was a medical doctor. The woman was lawfully married. Jealousy. But our God is not like that. Look at the people of the world. When those people in the secret society, if you by mistake break the law, what happened? 
immediate punishment, immediate death. Where is there a lot of psychiatric cases in Nigeria? Is some of them, like in psychiatry, you have neuropsychiatry and uh, psychopsychiatry. Neuropsychiatry is those ones that because of their use of drug, they become uh, mentally uh, impaired. Why those ones? Because of their deep spiritual involvement. When they break that covenant, what will happen? The devil has no mercy. He strikes. Our God is not like that. Our God is a faithful God. He's a gracious God. Long-suffering. He doesn't take time because it, it takes time for God to be angry. You understand? But that does not give us leverage to be offending God and be committing sin. Praise the Lord. God is the God of all creature. He is kind to all creature. God will always forgive all our iniquities. And this also has shown that whatever he has promised, he will do. This also goes to show that that covenant is an old covenant. That is why that uh, tablet which he made, he now said, now you make another tablet. It's an old covenant. It is a prolong of a new covenant that is coming, which me and you, we are enjoying in Jesus Christ today. Not only that, this is also a promise of his unprecedented marvel. If you want to study God, your brain will crash. Why? It's awesome. What is unpredictable? What is full of marvel? If not, you will say, why do ah, somebody who would descend so low? If I'm the person, I will destroy them. God is not like that. Praise the Lord. God is somebody who would always want the enemy and the enemy of his children to be under them. Praise the Lord. As Christians, what are we to do? We are to separate ourselves from idol. And not only that, we are to separate ourselves from idolatry. Not only that, we are to separate ourselves from immorality. Not only that, we are supposed so, supposed to separate ourselves with anything that has to do with the world and consecrate our life to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Our God that we serve, there is no other God like him. Full of grace, full of mercy, full of compassion. Uh, why would we now serve the devil that has no forgiveness compared to God? That is full of forgiveness. Praise the Lord. Question number two says, how should restored believers or backslider respond to God's mercy? Backsliders, those people who were in God before, and they backslid, and they descend. How should they respond to the mercy of God? Yes, anybody? A sister this time? Yes, Sister Sylvia. By repenting from their sins and, coming, and confessing their sins and coming back to God. Very simple. Repent your sins. Ask God for forgiveness. Moses asked God for their forgiveness. And what happened? He forgave. That easy. The question is, why will you die in your sin, O house of Israel? May God help us never to descend like the Israelites. And whenever or if there yeah, happened to by, by mistake a descent. What do you do? Run immediately to the Lord for forgiveness. Praise the Lord. Question number three states: State the evidence that Israel sins we are forgiven. What is the evidence to show that the sins of the Israelite we are forgiven? Yes, a brother. How can we show here? Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God decided to give them another set of laws. Mm. So he didn't say because they have destroyed them that, that they will not have anything to do with them again. Mm -hmm. He gave them another set of laws. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. This time around, he said, I did that that time. You, Moses, do it this time. I've forgiven you. Praise the Lord. God is always willing to forgive. Praise the Lord. We are going to the second point now, which is resources for the tabernacle and the appointed workmen. I also want to draw 
inference here. If we go to Exodus chapter 32, verse 2 and verse 3, I want to draw an inference here. Exodus chapter 32, verse 2 and 3. When they were to build the golden calf, and we want to compare it, when they were to build the idol, and when they were to build the, uh, the tabernacle. Let us learn something here. What is it? And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, of your daughters, and bring them on to me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which are in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. What did they do? In verse 4 he said, And he received them at their hand and fashioned it into a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods. Small letter, gods. These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Let us know now to Exodus chapter 35, verse 22. Exodus chapter 35, verse 22. What did they say? Now they want to build what? The tabernacle of God. <clears throat> verse 22 says, and, and they came, both men and women, as many as were willing hearted, and brought their what? Bracelets. Mark it again. Earrings, rings, tablet, and all jewels of gold, and every man made that of that, that, that every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto who? Unto God. What do we draw? What is the inference to draw here? Here, when they were to serve idol, what do they do? They brought the earring in their ears. They brought all the goods. This time around, they want to build the tabernacle for God. What do they do? The same thing, but this time, that one was out of proportion, not voluntary, but this time it was voluntarily. Why don't we wear earring in deeper life? that time, they were offering those ones to the idol. Now we are dedicating everything from our head to our toes. Everything we have to who? To God. To God. So, and we should do it how? Willingly. That time, they did it how? Out of compulsion. Ah, make us God. Okay? Since it was not out of the evolution of Aaron to do it. Because when Aaron was asked, ah, well, Moses asked, what did you do? He said, it's the people. They compelled him. No, nobody is compelling anybody. They did it how willingly. If we want to serve God, we should do it how willingly, not out of compulsion. If we want to give to God, we should do it how willingly. And God, also, if you look at that, God gave to the children of God. The children of God gave to God willingly. Out of enthusiasm, because they know how these parts, how the imperfect they are. That is why they gave. Why? For the completion of the tabernacle. Same thing here. We as children of God, we should also give willingly. Initially, they gave their earrings to Aaron to make the calf. Now, they gave same to Moses to make the tabernacle. So, what we are defined here is we should give lily. All those earrings of gold, that is why you don't see us wearing all this bracelet. We have offered everything at the tabernacle. Another thing we should also learn here is that as believers, we should give willingly for the service of God. We also see that leaders in the church, when we see people who are skilled in any way, we should make sure everyone use their talent. There are some people who are very good in mathematics. There are youth who need to be taught mathematics. Come up, use them. There are people who are very good at handling the children. And there are people who are very good handling youths. Come out for the service of God. There are people you know you can teach. You are eloquent. Come out. Look at our choir. Our choir is now a choir for our wives and our children. And we have Good people who have good voices here. Where are you? Come and use it for the service of God. That is it. Whatever talent God has given to you, come and use it for the service of God. Everybody gave what? Willingly. You in the church, what have you given to the service of God? 
you have to give willingly. Some of us know how to pray. Are you praying for the church? Everybody, there is no person that is useless in the church. Everybody has a specific talent that God has given us. God is saying that, bring that talent to my service to build my tabernacle. God will help us in Jesus' name. Question number four says, what was Israel's response to offering for the tabernacle and how should we believers respond to giving for God's work? How did Israelites respond? We as believers, how should we respond when it comes to giving to God's work? If you know you have not spoken, it's your time to speak. Yeah, bro, Christian, uh, you are spoken. Okay, bro, chikere. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, Israel responds to the building of the temple by giving willingly from their heart. So, they gave all they did from their heart. They were not forced. So, we believers, whatever we want to give to God, we should give it as we are giving to the God. It should come from our heart, not a persuasion of force. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God said we should give willingly. And not of necessity. We should give willingly. Somebody will say, I don't have to give. Who said you don't have? Everybody has. God has endued everybody with a talent. If you don't use the talent, the talent will rot away. Praise the Lord. We go to the third subheading, which is fabrication of the temple's material. When we are giving materials to God, it should not be useless materials. It will be qualitative materials. It will be materials that will be acceptable by God. After the materials of the Plamalanko were ready, the builder had to commence the work. The minister should build the body of Christ. The great commission to everybody in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 20. Mark chapter 16, verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 15 to 20. Praise the Lord. Let us open at that place. You can't say yes. Uh, I don't have anything to do. No, everybody has a thing to do. Mark 16, which is the last word of Jesus Christ in that book. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. To verse 20, he says, <clears throat> And he said unto them, Go ye into all the worlds and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. And he said, they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. So then, after the Lord has spoken unto them, he, received, he was received unto the heavens and sat on the right throne of God. What happened? Verse 20 says, And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord walking with them and confirming their word with signs following them. May signs follow us if we obey in Jesus' name. The Great Commission is for everybody. It's not only for the pastors. It's not only for the teachers. It's not only for the elders. It's for everybody. God said, Go ye. Who is the ye? It's you. It's me. That is why when we call for evangelism yesterday, how many people are there? Go ye into all the world. Your neighbor, go ye into all the world. You are supposed to preach the gospel to your neighbor. Why? We ourselves, we are supposed to be the evangelists today. Peter is no more here. James is no more here. Paul is no more here. Who is here now? Me and you. The world of sin, we are the one to convert them. We are to want to preach the gospel to them. Where, wherever I will go, we must teach them how to observe all things whatsoever Christ has taught us. What are we to do? We have to arise willingly. We have to resolve in our heart, look, this thing God has sent me. I must do it. What happened? In Mark chapter, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, Jesus Christ said, and Christ is our perfect example. He said, I must do the work of him that sent me. When Jesus Christ saw all the sinners, what he did? 
he had compassion on them. When we were doing evangelism and visitation yesterday, we saw three young girls. This girl should be about nine, ten, under the influence of alcohol and drugs. You need to see them dirty. On the middle of the road, you, one of the girls was just lying down inside the ditch. You saw the other girl lying down there. Just think about it. If that is your daughter, would you like it? Yeah. All those people in the pub house, you think they know what they are doing? No. You see those people when we go to Motherway Center on Saturdays, on Sundays, you see them drunk. You will see them struggling around. The they don't know what they are doing. As Christians, we are supposed to have compassion on them. See your neighbor. Do you tell them heaven and hell is real? If you do not tell them, God will not be happy on us. Why? God has entrusted us on this world. He has given us the seed. Go and plant it. Just scatter it like the, the, the sower. Spread it anyhow. Some will fall on wayside soil. Yes. Some will fall on the thorny soil. The thorns will choke it. Yes. But some will set definitely fall on the good soil that will bring forth fruit. Sixty fold. Hundredfold. Praise the Lord. As we obey, God will help us in Jesus' name. We need to be committed. We need to be committed. If you are not committed, you will not do the work. Praise the Lord. Question number five says, what should be the level of our commitment to the Great Commission? What should be the level of our commitment to the Great Commission? Yes, a sister this time. What should be our level of commitment to the Great Commission? The commission is to everybody. Yes? If you don't talk, I will point, I will point. Sister, Baulabi, yes, what is the level of our commitment? I can see you smiling. <laughs> oh, you don't know Sister Baulabi. That is it. Give it to her. By your left. <laughs> yes. I'm not Sister Ola. Okay. Correct me. What is the name again? Sister Nero. Nero. Forget my, forgive me. Sister Nero, yes, give it to us. Our level of commitment. Um, as Christians, we should be highly committed to the will of, to the gospel of the Lord, preaching the gospel. Praise the Lord. Yes, we should be highly committed. We should not take it as a casual thing. Praise the Lord. We all are gospel ministers, me and you. If you are born again, it is your responsibility that you go and preach the gospel. Praise the Lord. John chapter 9, verse 4, Jesus said, I must walk the walk of him that caught me. Why? It is day. The night cometh when no man can walk. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, he said, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. If you not go, he said, it's a necessity. It is laid on me. It is, whether I like it or not, is a thing I must do. And he now placed a curse on himself. He said, woe is me if I preach not what? The gospel. The question number six says, what are the responsibilities give, God has given to gospel preachers? What is the responsibility God has given to you as a gospel preacher? Praise the Lord. A brother at this time. What is the responsibility that God has given to us as gospel preachers? Brother Larry, yes, what is the responsibility as gospel preachers that God has given to us? That is Brother Larry. Um, responsibility to and preach the gospel to the to go to the whole world and to preach the gospel. Praise the Lord. Christ. We are to preach the gospel. It's our responsibility. Praise the Lord. Do you know one thing? If you look at Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18, Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 20, Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 6, God says, Do you want us to read it? Yes. Let us look at Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 
18. So that we will know how compulsory it is for us to really preach the gospel. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 18 says, When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked way, the, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. Look at the last words. But, what did he say? But, But his blood will I require at thy hand. May the blood of anybody not be required from our hand in Jesus' name. Our wicked neighbor, we need to talk to them. Those people in our office, we need to talk to them. On the street, we need to talk to them. Are you traveling in a bus? Are you commuting? Are you transiting? We need to speak to them. If we do not speak to them, what did the Bible say? Their blood will be required at our hand. Praise the Lord. Question number seven says, what debt do we owe our neighbors who are not in Christ? What debt do we owe our neighbor? We are all debtors and we must pay that debt. What is the debt to our neighbors who are not born again? Can anybody tell me? Yes, Pastor Festus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The gospel telling them about the love of Christ, has Christ that for them, also we need to save them for their sinful life. Praise Amen. the Lord. You owe them the gospel. Your neighbor, you owe them the gospel. Have you paid your debt to your neighbor? Have you paid your debt to the, your co-worker in the office? Have you paid your debt to the, or your fellow travelers? Let us pray. Let us commit our, the word of this morning to God's hand. The songwriter said, must I go and empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior's soul? Not one soul with we to be greet him. Are you going to go empty-handed to meet the Lord? Are you going to go, go to heaven? Not one soul at all to give God. Oh, Lord, we commit this word into our, uh, your hand this morning. We will never be found wanting on the last day in Jesus' name. Amen. study for our site to speak. We have considered chapters 32, or 34, 35, and 36. Um, based on what uh, we have uh, studied this morning, are there questions? Hello. Praise the Lord. Are there questions based on uh, no question? Um, the passage we have uh, studied this morning or the passages that we have studied this morning, they are um, what I call a follow-up um, to what we've been looking at. Remember that uh, God had a purpose that Israel will serve him uh, at Mount uh, Sinai. And we know the story, uh, what happened, how they went into idolatry, how they sinned, how they eventually uh, fell short of the grace of God. But as we come to chapter 34, uh, um, we find the uh, covenant renewed. It is essentially a time that, you know, after Moses had uh, 
prayed and um, pleaded with God not to destroy uh, Israel. Then God said, okay, I will give them another chance. And that tells you that our God is the God of a second chance. And I pray that he will give whoever has that need the second chance in Jesus' name. So what did he do? He asked Moses to come up to the mountain again. Mount, um, uh, you know, Moses had uh, been to the mountain before, and he had received those tablets of um, stones, uh, that is the covenant, the law. But in his rage, in his anger, when he saw Israel committed uh, you know, abominable things, idolatry, uh, drinking, bowing down to the golden calf, he broke it. That's 32 in uh, verse 19. He broke those tablets. And eventually, this time, God told him, come up again. And he went back there. On arrival, God told him, okay, this is what is going to happen. I am going to um, give you another law so that you can take it back to Israel. But this time, it wasn't God that wrote it. The first one was written, the Bible says, by the finger of God. But the second one, God had told Moses that I will dictate it and you will write it down. And eventually, that was what happened. Um, brethren, why did Moses break the first tablet? And we should also bring that home personally to ourselves. Moses broke that covenant because Israel broke the law of God. Moses destroyed that covenant because Israel, you know, did something that was very sad, very, very, in fact, unbelievable. For the short period that he was away. And many times that's what happens also to every one of us. Whatever covenant we have with the Lord. Once we break it, then the law of God cannot really be for us. You cannot lay claim. You cannot appropriate all the promises and the blessings that comes with it. Because already you have broken it. And that's why it's important that we know that the tablets of stone was broken because Israel broke the covenant. And eventually... God had mercy. My prayer is that God will have mercy in Jesus' name. Then by the time we come to verses six, seven, uh, verses 5, 6, and 7, something interesting uh, I read in that passage. We find revelation of God's presence and companionship. God needed to tell them that, look, I, what I wanted to do, I would still do. Come with me to that passage <clears throat> as I read in Exodus chapter 32, uh, 34 from verse 5. Exodus chapter 34. I'm reading there from verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud. Let's stop there. This is not the first time we find... Um, God descending. God, every time, wants to accompany uh, uh, us, and just like he did with Israel on a journey. You know, in the Old Testament, the cloud represents the Shekinah glory of God. And you will find that in different passages of the scriptures, God, you know, will come in his glory, to accompany people on a journey. Think about it. When Moses was first called on this assignment, what did he say? He says, I will go if you will go with me. <clears throat> and I think that's very instructive for every one of us. There is nothing that we are doing as Christians if we don't, you know, invite God into it. If we don't let God be our companion, 
we will fail. Or rather, the journey will be difficult. And God here, he revealed his presence and his companionship to Israel. The Bible says he descended. Look at that passage again. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And that was the first revelation. God wanted to let you know, Israel know that it's my presence that makes a difference. It's my presence that you need on this journey. And we too, on life's journey, we need the presence of God. It doesn't matter how gifted we are. It doesn't matter how much strength we have. It doesn't matter how powerful we are. We need that presence of God. And I pray the presence of God will abide with us in Jesus' name. The Bible says in verse 6, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaim, proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness. What we do find here, that is the revelation of God's personality and character. The first one was his presence and companionship. Here he says, Look at my person. Look at my character. He's a gracious God. He's a merciful God. He's, 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 he's full of truth. Look at it again in verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abound, abundant in goodness and truth. In verse 7, keeping mercies for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the father <clears throat> upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. That is the character of God. That is who God is. That's the personality of God. In as much as he's merciful, he's gracious, he's good, he's full of, you know, mercy. But then, he says, he will by no means overlook sin. He will by no means. Look at, if God was going to, you know, compromise his character, it would have been for Israel. But God will not. And if he will not do it for Israel, he can be sure he won't do it for any one of us. And that's why it's very important that we know that God is merciful, is gracious, but he will by no means clear the guilty. He will by no means say, ah, yeah, it doesn't matter. That's why you find in the church, it doesn't matter who you are. You, are, you did what you are not supposed to do discipline you. If you. It doesn't matter. And that, if there's anything I like about this church, that is it. You see other churches in the world, when somebody did something, they say, ah, he's dicking, so, so, so. So he's untouchable. Not in deeper life. Not in deeper life. And that is the word of God. If God himself will by no means clear the guilty, then nobody is above correction and rebuke. And it's good that we, you know, and it's so good that if you have the privilege of being corrected and rebuked, it's, it's, it, it, it is something that is born out of love. Except where you just want to do, do what you want to do and you don't want anybody to complain. No, and it should not be. And eventually, <clears throat> God went on. Uh, in that passage, in verse 8, Look at what the Bible says. After uh, God has proclaimed himself, and Moses made haste and bowed his head toward, his head towards the earth and worshipped. If, if that is the same thing we ought to do, when we know who God is, when we know the character of God, when we know that God will not condone or tolerate sin, when we know that he will not overlook iniquity, when we know who God is, 
you need to, you know, reverence him. You need to fear and tremble at the word of God. That was what Moses did. He trembled when he saw that, no, truly you are God. Because he saw the reaction of God when Israel sinned. That I'm going to kill all of them. It doesn't, it doesn't take, cost me anything. You will still want people to accompany you on this journey. Of these stones, I will raise up, you know, a children unto Abraham. And that is how, you know, God is. And I pray, you know, just as Israel, you know, failed to understand and took God for granted, we will not make the same mistakes in Jesus' name. Eventually, after God had told them that, the reaction of Moses was that he worshipped. Then, after he had done that, come to verse 10. Look at what the Bible says. This was where the covenant was now renewed. And he said, behold, I make a covenant. Let's stop there. Behold, I make a covenant. Isn't it interesting that God did not consult with Israel to make the covenant? He didn't say, come, come and sit down. Since I told you what to do before and you could not do it, let's now see. Tell me what you can do. Then maybe I will factor that into the equation. And since you did not leave, uh, maybe the standard I gave you before was very high. Let me lower the standard now. No. God says he's the one that makes the covenant. I make the covenant. I tell you, I dictate the rules by which you should live. It's not you that will tell me, oh, uh, this is how I want to live, uh, how I want to live. You know that English um, uh, um, uh, adage that says, he who plays the piper dictates the tune. It is, the, it is God that is, you know, dictating here because he's the one that is playing the piper. So when we come to God, we come to God with the readiness of mind to align ourselves with his commandments, not to do our own thing or do it our own way. And that's very important. Look at that passage again in verse 10. And he said, behold, I will make a covenant. Before all thy people, I will do marvels. Such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. The terrible thing that the Bible is saying there is wonders. Not terrible as in you know, the negative sense. He's saying that what I'm going to do with you, the whole world will see and they will, they, will, they, will, they will marvel. They'll be surprised. And how can God do so much for a nation, for a people? And I pray that even in your life, in my life, the world will see God at work in Jesus' name. Observe in verse 11, because of what God is going to do, because of the, 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 the things that God, the marvel and the wonders that God wants to do, he says, observe thou that, that which I command thee this day. Behold, I will drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Ivite and the Jebusite. Can you see that? Every verse of this passage is so wonderful. God told them, the world will see what I am going to do. He says, but because of what I am going to do, I am going to uh, take out all the enemies round about you. But you cannot afford to live in disobedience while I do that. He says, observe now to do what I command you. And leave me with all the enemies that are round about you. And that's the only thing God requires from us. That's why there is no reason for any Christian to be troubled or be afraid. The Christians that are troubled or afraid of man or any, they are, their life is not right. I guarantee you that. 
If you find a Christian that looks at the face of men and is afraid, or he looks at the people in the one community, watch them very well. There's something wrong with their life. The Bible says the righteous is bold, as bold as a lion. Not even when you have the promise of God. And they are doing this, they are doing that, there are enemies before me and behind me. Nonsense. The Bible says they that trust in their God shall be strong and do exploits. I mean, that, that's what God requires. Just, just live for God. Just live for God. Depend on him. Trust him. And you, you will be fine. Oh, you think every time? <laughs> I know I have a lot of battles. Some of the battles that I have, I guarantee that some people in the church here don't have as much. Both here and, 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 and away. It has never taken sleep away from me. I sleep when I put, when I lie down, I sleep. Sometimes I don't even remember to pray when I'm sleeping. By the time I've read, 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 and I'm tired, I just put my this in there and I slept. And that is it. Because I know that whatever is kept in the custody of God, it is safe. My life is hid in Christ Jesus. So you find an individual that is unsettled and that is, then he's not settled with God. Because if you are, the, 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 the devil cannot make you fret. The devil cannot make you to be anxious. And I pray the Lord will bring us to that place in Jesus' name. Um, eventually, in verse um, uh, 12, take it to thyself. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest. Lest it be for you a sneer in the midst of of D. Say, take heed. In verse 13, but you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their grooves. For thou shalt worship no other God for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And that is I mean, applicable to each and every one of us. We mentioned part of it last week. Don't let anything you know, occupy the place of God in your life. Don't let it. But as long as that is taken care of and you are not, you know, envying, you know, the lifestyle of the people of the land, especially if their practices are sinful and abominable. You don't envy them. You don't even ask, bother to ask, how are you people doing it? And they may tell you, they may excuse it. I had a colleague that uh, the son was 16 at the time, and he was the one buying condoms for that boy because he says he knows he cannot, you know, he cannot tell him not to, you know, have sex at 16. He's only telling him that he should do it safely. And do you know, somebody else too will say, ah, Kiko Yibo knows that he will come and say, ah, my son or my daughter, have you been practicing you be, you know, you make sure if you are going to do it, uh, take, take, take pills. And you begin to, you know. But I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Brethren, the Bible tells Israel they must renounce idolatry. It says that is something that God will not condone. He will not tolerate it. And more importantly, it's not enough for us not to go into idolatry or to go into the practices of the people of the land. By the time you come to verse, you know, 18, 
The Bible says something in verse 18. Look at it with me. The feast of unleavened bread shall thou keep. What does that represent? It represents purity. He said that feast, you must keep it. Which essentially is saying that it's not enough to just be a Christian. There must be purity. There must be holiness in your life. There must not be any, any form of defilement. Defilement by watching things you are not supposed to watch or saying things you are not supposed to say or touching things you are not supposed to touch. Anything that defiles. It says, Israel, you must keep it. Look at it again in verse 18. The feast of unleavened bread shall thou keep. Seven days shall thou eat unleavened bread, as I commanded thee in the time of the month Abib. For in the month Abib thou camest out from Egypt. This was then. But now God requires from us every day to be pure. Trust that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Um, chapters uh, 35 and uh, 36, I will not uh, go into that because that is essentially about the offering for the tabernacle and the building of the you know, uh, tent meeting. So that were just you know, specifications and the rules. But this chapter 34 is so, so, you know, so, 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 you know, the notes that I made reading this thing, this chapter alone, is so much. And it's important as we read, we read not just for the knowledge or for the understanding that we need, but also to bring them home and apply and examine our own lives and see how we measure. And I pray that the Lord will help us by his grace to meet even with the standard of heaven in Jesus' name. The covenant was renewed. Every covenant that the Lord has made with us, he will renew it. If we have mistakenly broken the covenant by sin or carelessness, the Lord will give us a second chance. Let's rise up on our feet and talk to the Lord. Let's commit ourselves unto the Lord and ask God that in his graciousness, in his mercifulness, in his, you know, goodness, he will, he will reveal himself. Remember the abiding presence of God? The Bible says the Lord descended down in the cloud. The Shekinah glory of God. How much do you pray for him? How much do you seek him? How much do you thirst for him? That in everything that you do, the presence of God is abiding. You know that it's abiding. Talk to the Lord in prayer. That, oh yes, your, upon your family, the presence of God will abide. In this church, the presence of God will abide. In your personal life, there will be a tangible evidence of the abiding presence of God. And as you do, my brother, my sister, you can be sure, you, you will not lose any battle in the name of the Lord Jesus. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Call upon the Lord. That, oh yes, the presence of God in the life of a man guarantees his safety guarantees his dominion, guarantees that no weapon formed against him shall prosper. Talk to the Lord. That is all we need as Christians. That is all we need. My brother, my sister, cultivate it. Seek for it. Pray for it. Ask for God. God, whatever you do, don't leave nor forsake me. Take not away your presence and your spirit from me. That was the psalm of David. And the Lord is telling us even this morning how significant that is. Oh yes, to every one of us as Christians, talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord God of heaven, he will do it in your life, in my life. In the name of the Lord Jesus. But don't defile yourself. Stay away from idols. The Bible says, little children, stay away. Flee from idols. Talk to the Lord. What is that idol in your life? It doesn't necessarily have to be the golden calf. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, mo a graven image. Is it your job, your career? Is it sex? Is it money? 
talk to the Lord that, oh yes, he will be enthroned in your life. He will be Lord and King over your life. In the name of the Lord Jesus, call upon the Lord this very morning. If all these things are in place, I guarantee you, I assure you that God is faithful. He will keep his own part of the covenant. My brother, don't break the covenant. Don't break the law. Don't break, oh yes, the commandments of God. Willfully. Because the word of says, God, the word of God says, if we sin willfully after the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice. Talk to the Lord this very morning. That the Lord God of heaven, he will help you and I. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, we pray.